can't let nobody tell you what you can't be or what position you gonna be on or what position you in. Cause shit, we come from nothing. If that's the case, we wouldn't even be here. If I believed them back then, my teachers would tell me, you a loser. Get out of my class, you're gonna be dead by 21. It was like that, it was rough. Teacher talking to you nasty. You don't believe in believing, you don't see nobody making it. But I still believe I can make it through all that, so why would I listen to anybody? Where we come from, if you're not locked up and dead, you win it. Back in 1973, the New Orleans sniper, as he was called, killed nine people and injured 12 others in separate attacks. We aired this next segment, talking with journalists who covered the event 49 years ago. The morning and Sunday of tragedy seems at this point to be far from over. Even three decades later, the tragedy is shrouded in mystery and vivid, often painful memories of that Sunday morning in January 1973. That's when a sniper named Mark Essex terrified the city and held police at bay, firing shots and taking more than a half dozen lives. It was the firefighters who were first on the scene. And as the firemen raised the ladder to fight the fire, the first known shots of what may well be New Orleans' most tragic day felled a fireman from the ladder. When I was growing up, me and my friends, we used to, uh, we used to be hustling back then. And this is like in the 80s, like 84, 83, 82. I mean, we was just real kids. We had to be uh, 8, 9, 10 years old. But we would wash people car windows, you know, with the squeegees and stuff. And we would go on Bourbon Street and break dance. Anything to get some nickels, quarters, whatever it took. And we would go to McDonald's and Burger King. And there was a, a, a store, there was a cheap store. I can't think, Bargain Center was the name of the store. We used to go to Bargain Center and, you know, spend our little five, six dollars that we done made on different things and sometimes we even make twenty dollars a piece you know at nine ten years old you have twenty dollars in your pocket in the eighties that was a lot of money so we would go buy a lot of things um we always walk to canal street because we from uptown so we walked to canal street and it was not one time that i can think off the top of my head well we were passed by City Hall and passed by the Howard Johnson. And we would always look up and be like, hey, man, they said the dude got up there named Mark Essex. We ain't really knew his name. We just caught what we thought we knew. And we was like, man, dude got up there and shot a bunch of police coming out of City Hall. He was mad because the police had done him something and he just was tired of it. And that was the official story that we got. We never knew. The, the inner makings of the whole incident. We just knew that a black dude got up on the rooftop and shot some people. We was just kids and we wasn't even born. Maybe some of us wasn't even born when it happened. And it's crazy because we still got that story, but that was, we only got pieces of it. Learning more now as an adult has been astonishing. And I know people should know his story, know everything about him, his frustrations, what he was going through. He was a young kid, he was 23 years old, and he died the way he died. And a lot of people will call him, uh, I've read documentaries, I mean, I've seen documentaries and I've uh, read articles and they some people call him the American sniper and I look on the other side and I see the other people which is my people black people and some call him a hero yeah a hero because some people felt like he was fighting for us yeah some people felt like he was fighting for us Mark James Robert Essex was born in Emporia, Kansas, the second of five children born to Mark Henry and Nellie Essex. He was raised in a close-knit and religious household. His father was a foreman in a meat packing plant and his mother counseled preschool-age children in a program for disadvantaged children. 
Emporia, and the community Essex was raised, consisted of 19,000 people and prided itself on long tradition of racial harmony. As a child and adolescent Essex had many friends of all races and seldom, if ever, encountered any form of racism. As a child Essex developed a passion for the Cub Scouts and an aptitude for music, playing the saxophone in his high school band. He also developed a passion for hunting in the rivers and streams within and around the city and developed an ambition to become minister in his teens. He was constantly making new friends. He also dated girls of all races. And the only reason I bring up race in this is because it actually plays a very big role in this whole story today. Mark was a great kid. He never got in trouble growing up. The only time he ever really had any encounters with the police was when they pulled him over for driving when they thought he was too young to drive. He was of age to drive, but he was only 5'4", so he was kind of a small guy, and the police pulled him over thinking that he was underage and driving. That was Mark's very first encounter with the police, and it was basically profiling. <laughs> So, uh, not a great start, I guess. Mark graduated high school in 1967. He did a quick semester of college, but decided to drop out and pursue something different. He started working in the same meatpacking plant as his father, and that's where he discovered that he truly wanted his life to go in a different direction. So he actually enlisted in the Navy. He joined the Navy on January 13th, 1969 at the age of 19. During this time, his parents, Mark and Nellie, said that he was a happy-go-lucky kid. He never had any issues. He was super bright, and he was very friendly to everyone that he encountered. Mark Essex was assigned to the Naval Air Station at Imperial Beach, California. He passed his initial training with high esteem for all of his superiors. They recommended that he enroll into the Naval Dental Program. He was a technician specializing in endodontics and periodontics. As his naval career progressed, Mark started noticing a lot of racism coming from the white service members towards the black service members. Within his first year of his naval service, Mark took a job as a bartender at an enlisted men's club named Jolly Rotors. There, Mark discovered that certain rooms were actually off limits to black people. Mark wrote a letter to his mother and discussed all the racism that he was experiencing within the Navy. He expressed concern and said that the Navy wasn't exactly what he thought it was going to be. Throughout his first year in the Navy, he had risen through the ranks and was now a seaman, but he was still being harassed on a daily basis. Mark began taking sedatives to help him sleep and ease some of the tension that he felt while he was in the Navy. Mark then became very close friends with a black colleague named Rodney Frank. Rodney described himself as a black militant. They would actually spend a lot of their free time hanging out together discussing all the racism that they've experienced throughout the Navy. By the summer of 1970, both Mark and Rodney became radicalized. Rodney encouraged Mark to read literature that was written by the founders of the Black Panther Party. By August of 1970, both Mark and Rodney were overcome with their rage. They were both so upset about the racism that they were seeing in the Navy that they just became even more radicalized. All of this led to Mark getting into a physical altercation with an NCO, which is a non-commissioned officer. Mark said that the NCO made a racist comment to him as they passed each other in the hall, which led Mark to then start a fight with him. Mark and this NCO had to go to a disciplinary hearing. They agreed to go their separate ways, and neither of them received any discipline for the fight. Mark was constantly receiving even more harassment after this fight. He was also now being intimidated by the white personnel that outranked him. Two months after the altercation with his NCO, Mark Essex went AWOL from the Navy. Mark called his mother and told her that he was coming home because he couldn't stand all the racism in the Navy. While he was at home, Mark told his parents about everything that happened. He also expressed to his parents the growing hatred that he had towards white people. Mark's parents attempted to reason with him 
but it didn't really work. He was pretty radicalized at this point, and there was really nothing that was going to stop him. Mark's rage was only worsened when he actually returned to the Navy to face his criminal hearing for going AWOL. During the hearing, Mark told all of his superior officers about all the racism that was happening throughout the ranks. Mark's superior and kind of like his lawyer was Lieutenant Hatcher. Lieutenant Hatcher actually provided a pretty good defense for Mark. He told him that he was doing great in all of his work there in the Navy and that he was enraged by all the racism that he had been receiving and he stuck up for Mark. However, the disciplinary panel didn't see it that way. They discharged Mark from the Navy for general unsuitability on February 11th, 1971 at the age of 21. This whole experience in general just fanned the flames for Mark. He was so upset that A, he got discharged from the Navy, but the Navy didn't do anything about any of the racism that the black personnel were experiencing. After his discharge from the Navy, Mark went to Manhattan and joined a local chapter of the Black Panther Party. Obviously, joining the Black Panther Party, he became even more radicalized and even more entrenched in those thoughts. They introduced him to guerrilla warfare and Mark studied all of the tactics that went along with it. This soon led to Mark purchasing his first firearm. It was a Ruger 44 caliber carbine rifle. Soon after that, Mark returned home to Emporia, Kansas, where he began to target practice almost nonstop. He would go out to the countryside and shoot at targets. He actually became a very good marksman. After he became an expert with his rifle, he moved to New Orleans. Between 1971 and 1972, Mark actually moved between New Orleans and his home in Kansas about four times. He finally decided to settle down in November of 1972 and bought an apartment in New Orleans. During his time in New Orleans, Mark was enrolled into a federal program that allowed him to study vending machine repair. He was also able to enroll in a few African study courses. The African study courses allowed Mark to memorize a few hate slogans in a few different languages. Once he learned all of those hate slogans, he actually wrote them all over the walls in his apartment. During this time, Mark also got his hands on a 38 caliber revolver. He was leading a deeply secluded life at this point and was constantly battling depression. In September of 1972, police from New Orleans announced that they were creating a new program called the Felony Action Squad. This squad was formed to reduce the amount of violent crimes in New Orleans. The police superintendent at that time also announced that any threat to this squad would be met with deadly force. Now we get to see how the story really unfold because it's like you have a good kid got a good head on his shoulder you know he live he come from a small town you know so he, he he interact with white folks all the time so it's not a big deal to him you know what i'm saying he going through life you know and he's he's not really over smart but he's he, he gonna make it to be something you know what i'm saying and you know, he get a little tired of, uh, of the state that he in, the city that he live in, you know what I'm saying? He said, well, you know, I'm gonna get out and see the world, you know? And I can help my family, I can come back with a good education, you know what I'm saying? I can, you know, come back to my town and do something. So now, he joins the Navy. When he gets in the Navy, he think, oh man, he told his people I'm in the Navy, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, man, it's about to go down, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, that's why he in there. They treat him like shit. And he can tell they treat him like shit. And only, you know, his people. His black people. You know what I'm saying? Because he, he never was treated like shit because he was black before. He ain't never experienced this. This is new to him. And it's fucking with it. And it's fucking with it. He right home now like, man, I don't know, man. I don't know what the hell going on, man. He, they treat black people so bad. He's saying to make it even worse. The black people are scared. And you won't hear what's worse than that. He like the black people attacking each other. He said, man, that went, where we from, we don't see this. So he really like, I, he ain't really feeling the Navy no more. You know what I'm saying? Because he like, man, I should have stayed fucking at home some fucking well. But he didn't. He ain't staying. Now the whole time he, you know, contemplated what to do, what's going on. Like his mind fucked up. 
and this dude approached him and said, hey man, look, I, I, I know you, you know, you country bunking. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I want to sit down, let me talk to you. So he just ran it to him. He gave it to him hard and heavy. Like, man, this goes on throughout America. You just lucky you from the town that you from. Where well, don't, y'all don't get to see this. So remember, all of us feeling this. He said, you can't get mad with them dudes in the corner. They just not fighters. Everybody are not fighters. He said, now there's a, a group of us that are our fighters. And he went to running it down to him. You know, telling about the Black Panthers, you know, Henry New, Bobby Seale. He telling about the movement, civil rights. You know, this country dude ain't never heard none of this stuff before. He thought everybody was holding hands and saying kumbaya throughout the world. You gotta remember, this is time before the internet, this time before TV was even popping like it. You know, this is the 70s, the 60s. So, he listening to this dude, this, this dude telling him all this dude name was, was uh, Rodney Frank. He was from New Orleans. And he was a part of the movement over there in the Night Ward. You know, they had all that, they had the Black Panthers down there, and he was a part of that. And at this time, especially this time, when he's sitting there talking to Mo XS on this ship, was the exact same time that the New Orleans cops was raiding the Black Panthers' houses down there in the night ball, dragging them out there, putting them in jail, locking them up. So he, the dude right in the front, he pissed off. He on the ship and his people way over here getting fucked off. So he's spitting everything to the youngster. He just giving it to him. Like, you know, this is what's up. So the youngster eating it. He eating it. So now, he going about his day. Every time one of these white folks say something, he just gonna hit the fan with it. And that's what happened. He coming through the hall. You know, he got his fucking head up high now. You know what I'm saying? He's looking at these motherfuckers, but see them, them white folks ain't like it. So what one of them had to say? You know he got it. Y'all got one of them gonna say something slick. I think I think the exact words or close to the words were Man, it must have was all good a long time ago. When the only time you seen a nigga on a ship, he was in the gallows. For people that don't know what that means, I'm gonna break it down to you kind of quickly. That means you niggas ain't been on a ship, and when we saw you on one, nigga, you was down there at the bottom of that bitch because we was you was slaves, we was bringing your ass over. And this nigga saying that was the good old days. So honestly, I don't know who swung the first lick. None of that type of stuff, but somebody just wants something because they started fighting. I ain't lying. I can see Monk taking off because he's frustrated at this point. So I can see him swinging first. So they broke him up and all that type of shit. You know what I'm saying? And long story short, man, they kicked him out of the fucking Navy. So now he done went back home. You know, he got a little shame on it, but he understood what happened. No, he ain't crazy. So now... He go shoot up to New York, cause you know, he probably heard some things about New York. You know what I'm saying? Go up there and he start fucking with the Black Panthers up there. You gotta remember, you got a partner in New Orleans, Black Panther. Rodney Frank. So now, bam. He going back and forth. So he finally start going out in New Orleans. He fucking with Rodney Frank. He shoot back home a couple of times. But now he like, you know what, I'm going to shoot the doors, I'm going to stay down there, you know what I'm saying? When he get there, he fucking with Rodney Frank. They wind up being roommates. You know, he got into a whole bunch of other things too, but he was like, you know, because he liked the music, you know what I'm saying? He, he did the French Quarter thing, Bourbon Street, walk around doing a little music, whatever. But he was also into all kind of other stuff going on, you know, he had got a little class and stuff like that, you know. He trying to better himself, but you know, people don't forget. He's still a Black Panther. The Black Panther's still alive. This is 73, 72. So these niggas been plotting. 
shit. They been plot. Last time. And here we got Mark XX. See, here's the part that a lot of people won't tell you. Is when Mark XX had came to New Orleans, he had set roots down in him. He got to know people. This was after the Black Panthers had got raided down in the Night War. See, originally the Panthers was in the St. Thomas Project, but they got ran downtown by the police department and the mayor. So they found them a spot downtown in the Night War. That was in 1970. When Mark started his journey, it was in 71, 72. And he was revitalizing the Black Panthers. He was organizing. He was doing all kinds of things. Protesting. He was there. He was joining the Black Panther Party back together in New Orleans. All those guys who was left over from that 1970 uh, raid down in the Night Wall. All those dudes still existed. They still was fighting. They had a little wind knocked out of them, but they still was fighting. And Mark, he came with that total radicalness. He was with that extremist. He was like, we're going we're, we're gonna to clean this up. We're going to kill a bunch of folks. They don't want to respect us. We're going to make them respect us. And that's where his head was. And the police, yeah, all the local police, they knew him. They would always snatch him off the street, beat him up. Bring him down to the jailhouse, whip on him, and just let him go. Because he wasn't doing no crime. He just was protesting. And you know, they don't like that. They ain't never liked it. And he was organizing. And he was trying to get everybody back together who was involved in the Black Panther Party. And he hadn't succeeded. And people had started following him. And listening to him, the house that they went to on Dry Street after he died, they only found a waterbed up in there and a bunch of writing all over the wall. That's the place they used to have meetings at. They used to meet there and speak and talk and reason with each other. There's some Black Panthers that I know of that knew him. Knew him personally. There's even some that knew the day he went purchase all the ammunition. So he already knew he was going to war. It was the final straw what happened at Southern University. And for Mark, he had to go. Because see, when you're a man and you stand on principles, and you standing up on that podium and you preaching and teaching and you saying you can't do this and you can't do that and we're going to stand for this and we ain't falling for nothing. And here it is. It's time to react to that. It was time. But yeah, there's plenty of times that Mark XS had bumped hands with the, the local police department. And if you can recall the situation that happened on top of the Howard Johnson Hotel, that was the second incident. That wasn't the first one. The first incident, he went around a jailhouse. And he killed one guy and shot another one. Now, I'm just speculating. Maybe they was there when he was getting beat on. Or maybe... They was watching while he was getting beat on. Whatever the reason, he decided to go around to the jailhouse and kill somebody. That was his goal. And he did kill somebody. Not sure if he killed the right person or not, because the person was black. Or maybe he just figured like, hey, you have a uniform. You're a cop. 
All y'all gotta die. I mean, that's one way to look at it. The mayor of the city and the police chief, they covered it up. They ain't want nobody to know who Mump SS was. They ain't want people to know that they already knew him. They knew him from the streets. They knew him from protesting. He was that person. They wanted him dead. He just was doing too much. He was trying to get the black people in New Orleans to join together and fight racism. He was a black panther, a real black panther. And he was a guy who was ready and willing to die for what he believed in. And he proved it. He died for what he was believed in. And that's very significant. And you can see how the police and the mayor and all those government officials covered it all up. Like he was just a nobody dude from nowhere. No one knew him. No one knew nothing about him. That was a lie. Everything that came out about Mo XS come from them. The press release, that was from them. We didn't control any newspapers. We didn't control the news stations. They controlled all those things and they had taken over the narrative. They put it out there how they wanted to. If they were ever to be real with the public and say, hey, we already knew who this guy was. We knew he was up too far as protesting. We didn't think he was going to take it this far, but we definitely wanted to get rid of him because he was a problem. He was a problem like Fred Hampton. He was a problem. And he was becoming worse because you are what most people would consider a foreigner. You're not from New Orleans, Louisiana. He was from Kansas. And the police felt like, oh, here come this country nigga coming down here disrupting our situation down here. And you gotta think, they just got rid of the Black Panthers in the night war. So they felt like, shit, we got rid of them, and he, he come trying to start it back up. And it was even some black people looking at it like that. Oh man, here come another nigga with this black power stuff. Yeah, they always had dollars like that. They're always gonna be dollars like that. I had told you that he had wrote a letter to the news station. And he had told the news station what he was going to do. So some of this stuff could have been prevented. I had told him that he had sent it to the newspaper. And he was like going in on him. He told him how he was doing it and everything. That's why I think, and this is my personal opinion, that they knew exactly who he was. I just, uh, just looked it up on my phone and I found what he told This is what he told me. It says, he started the letter off saying, Africa greets you. On December 31st, 1972, approximately 11 p.m., the downtown New Orleans Police Department will be attacked. Reason? Many. But the death of two innocent brothers will be avenged. And many others. P.S. Tell that pig Jerusalem the felony action squad ain't shit. And he signed it Mal, a model. That was the name he changed it to. He changed his own name to Mal, a model. Now, if the police knew his Black Panther name, then they knew who the letter came from. So he wasn't hiding the fact what he was about to do. He let them know. They claimed that they didn't open the letters after everything had done went down. I mean, that's possible, but who knows? Who knows? Why you think that it was so easy to whitewash it? Because nobody spoke up. The Black Panthers wasn't going to say nothing about it. They wasn't even going to claim him as a Black Panther. I mean, later came out, he had Black Panther views and stuff like that, but the Black Panther had them been dismantled and destroyed in the world at that point.
they went that night war and, and just did them bad. But they still was around. They hadn't disappeared. They still was doing things. They just wasn't as visible anymore. And Mark was organizing it all back together. He was putting it all back together. But they couldn't claim that. Because if they claim that, man, them people gonna go killing black people left and right. And they know it. All the black people was gonna suffer. If they had found out that this dude was like really, really putting it down, like trying to make it happen, and the Black Panther sided with him and the Black Panther was backing him, man, them people was gonna come and kill everybody. They was gonna be a bunch of niggas in jail. They was gonna be a lot of funerals. You know what we felt, you know, shit. He gonna be the DJ in the second line. You can have both of them. You gonna go out. Cause the people gonna come through killing everybody. That's how they was thinking. So they kept their mouth closed. And that was the right thing to do. Cause at that time, if they would have started killing a bunch of black people, Sooner or later, black people was gonna get tired and they was gonna fight back. Just like Mom X said, they was gonna fight back. And then there was gonna be a bunch of niggas on top of us. Mom XX was just one of the dudes who got pissed off first and decided to fight back first. He had not seen him And I ain't gonna sit here and like say what he done was the correct thing to do. Cause people lost their lives and we don't know who them people was, you know? They had families too. So you gotta respect that. 